Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your co-hosts are Pastor Steve Macias and Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor. Hello and welcome to the 94th episode of the Out of the Question podcast. I'm Andrea Schwartz and I'm joined by Steve Macias. Hi Steve, how you doing? I am doing well. It's good to be on here with you. Good. So we're still in the midst of the sheltering in place. And a lot of the initial discussion about this coronavirus involved the elderly and involved the elderly in nursing homes especially. And so the question we're asking today is, why is grandma in a nursing home in the first place? So let's delve into that question, and then, Steve, what's the question behind the question? Before we get into the question behind the question, there's some you know, prerequisites we have to cover to make, make it sure that we're not being unloving or acting ignorantly. When we say nursing home, we're not talking about folks who are in end-of-life care or folks who have terminal disease or, or some type of full-time nursing care situation. We're talking about people who have chosen to spend the last decade or two decades of their life in maybe assisted living or maybe just a senior home. And these are largely the types of places where, as Andrea has noted, the coronavirus has been plaguing. But they're something entirely foreign and strange to not only Western civilization, but to the people of the Bible. When we talk about grandma in the nursing home, what we really are recognizing is this disjointed nature of the family. In our day and age, it's, it's common to malign the nuclear family as not the ideal, right? The, the liberal or the feminist or the, the modernist says, why do we need a family with a mother, a father uh, in this type of nuclear model? Well, they're right to criticize that because in the Bible, the model is not just a nuclear family in the sense of mom, dad, and kids, but a multi-generational family that communities were literally attached. They would build houses with the idea that homes would be added on. And so when we live in this day and age, and we have all of these sob stories about how we're disconnected from grandma because she's locked down in a nursing home and we can't even visit her but through double pane glass, why is grandma in the nursing home? It's because we as a generation have neglected the elderly and we have lost this multi-generational view of the family. And we have created, again, an artificial crisis for the elderly by refusing to hear the promises and the sanctions of the scripture for the family. And this sort of goes back to the idea that we, as much as we'd like to think of ourselves as enlightened, really racism isn't as prevalent as Ageism. In other words, we really do have biases against different age groups. And I think part of this is intentional on the part of those that hate the family. So what's the argument against a lot of children? Well, you see, you're bringing too many people into the world and you're using up resources. What's the argument against the elderly? They've had their day. They shouldn't be trying to use up the resources of other people. And so we really have categorized people that it sort of sets up conflict where there shouldn't be conflict. I know I grew up with my grandparents living in the same house downstairs. And I can't really speak to what it was like for my parents in that situation, but I loved it. I look back on my grandmother as the one who bailed me out of all the things, all the troubles that I got into, whether I wouldn't eat or I, I wasn't doing something that my mother wanted. She was there to be a mediator. And I think there were probably times when I was, you know, three hours after dinner and I was still sitting at my place Grandma came upstairs, and I'm pretty sure my mother called her and said, would you come up and help me because we have a stalemate going on. So I think we've lost how valuable it is to have multi-generational households. That's right. And part of it is we have begun to accept the Industrial Revolution's idea of the individual as a utility. 
So think about, for example, how we structure our goals and purposes in our life, and that will inform how we organize our households. So since the industrial revolution and all of the benefits of you know, commercialized industry, uh, there's also been a change in how we viewed family. And because we've allowed the world to shape our families by saying able-bodied men and able-bodied women ought to go in and put in their hours and then that will be their mark of productivity. We've allowed that kind of worldly definition of purpose and utility to creep into our understanding of the family. And so instead of viewing all of life as kind of kingdom work, we say the real kingdom work is uh, what we do on missions. And then our real job is what we do for money. And that our real goal of our life is to find rest from this. Uh, to find leisure from our work. And so the elderly then get pitted against the young. There's this kind of Marxian class distinction between who can provide the best utility for the industrialized economy rather than recognizing the family as one cohesive unit. And so you can see this really easily uh, when we talk about just financial planning for families. And you mentioned it with children and we mentioned it with the senior home. The goal, it seems, is every American family is to work enough that you afford your house, send your kids to a good school, and provide for your own retirement. And inside or implicit in all of those goals is that we're going to escape work and find our way into leisure. So, you know, inside this question of why is grandma inside the nursing home is this really pagan goal that the fruit of our labor might be not laboring anymore, or the fruit of our labor might be leisure. And Dr. Rushton, he talks about this in several lectures where he says that this pagan ideal really flips the idea of kingdom on its head because what the goal of the kingdom is, is through grandparents and parents and children, the family might come into its power and authority and that we're building up something other than our own leisure. Right. And it's so funny how we have such a youth oriented culture that people don't want to admit they're old. So many times I'll run into a young child and I'll say, how old are you? And he'll say, I'm five. And then he'll look at me and say, and how old are you? And his mother will say, you don't ask that question. Well, I just asked him how old he was. Why can't he ask me how old I am? It's because we have this idea that it's not polite. Well, if you embrace the idea of what the Bible says, that gray or white hair is the crown of old men or old women, then it's an honor. The other day I was walking in a park, and as I was walking, a little boy said to his mother, look, there comes a grandma. And his mother said, I'm sure she's a grandma. I, I think you're right. And so as I walked by, he looked at me and said, are you a grandma or a great grandma? And I said, well, I think I know why you say that. You saw the color of my hair. And he said, yes. I said, well, I'm a grandma and I'm proud of being a grandma. And the little boy said it with a big smile on his face. He wasn't insulting me. He was identifying me. And I think that it's time for we in the older generation to embrace the fact that we have years on this earth and that we don't need to be ashamed of the fact that our hair is gray. That's right. And that really is the posture of the scripture. Whether you talk about the way they prayed, uh, they called their God, uh, the God of, of Isaac or the God of Abraham. They somehow associated their div divine relationship with these kind of paternal uh, relationships. It would be kind of a slap in the face to modern people if I told my son, we believe in the God of Steve, right? So uh, it would almost seem self-centered. But their culture was so family-oriented that the faith was seen as something that was passed on from generation to generation. And in fact, many of them took their father's name, uh, and they were the son of so-and-so to describe how the multi-generational or the hereditary nature of generation, of begetting children, was part of the inheritance. And the scene you get throughout the scripture uh, of passing the baton or giving the faith to next generation is when the great patriarch, whether it's Isaac or Abraham or even Jacob, when they're in their 
old years. It's the sons are gathered around the bed. Uh, that's really not the picture we have today. Today we have the picture of dad was sent away, mom was sent away to spend their last years in isolation, that they're no longer of any value. Yet the picture in the scripture is that the most valuable thing in the household was the wisdom, the experience, and the leadership of grandma, great-grandpa. And before we think that that's just an Old Testament paradigm, it's shown by St. Peter. They call the leaders of the church the same thing we call our grandparents. They call them elders. The perspective on wisdom in the scripture is that that gray hair is worth something. And then they talk about the promises of the God. You can see St. Peter on the day of Pentecost saying, the promise is to you and your children, right? And so the idea is always multi-generational with the source of wisdom and faith coming from the older generation down to the younger. I know when I, I have three kids and when we had only one, we didn't live close to either grandparents. My father was across the country on the East Coast and my husband's mother lived in Southern California. We were in Northern California, but I didn't want him to miss out on the benefit of being exposed and interacting with those who were older. So we would make weekly visits to a local retirement home. And we'd always say we were going to go visit the grandmas and the grandpas. So we would go and sometimes my husband would be with us and we would spread out. My son would go talk to a bunch of people. I would go talk to people and my husband would go talk to people. And it was amazing to sit and talk to these people because they all had a past. They all had a time when they were young. I remember talking to one woman who had raised six sons all of whom were doctors. And yet you walk in and you say, oh, look at all these old people. This was a person with a history. And we so looked forward to it so that years later, when um, I was in a conversation with my mother-in-law, she basically very, you know, said, what, what would it be like if we all lived together? And then she went on to the next subject. And I remember telling my husband that night, I think your mom wants to move in with us. Well, he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, of course, of course, that's what we would do. Now, part of it, as I said, is I grew up with my grandparents living at home. So this was a very natural thing, but it's such a healthy thing for families to have the generations. It's true. And there's a, a news story that came out maybe last week related to this coronavirus, uh, related to a single mother. And so one of the great, really, disasters in the last 100 years with the breakdown of the family. Uh, and there's lots of causes for this. There's the, the advent of, of divorce as acceptable among uh, Christians or the prevalence of uh, various types of tol tolerable sins that have been allowed to destroy family or government social programs. Whatever the case may be, the reality is that American Christianity has a fractured view of the family. And so there are many faithful mothers who are single mothers, and there are many faithful individuals who are in broken relationships or broken families. And before we just write out and say, well, sin has created these situations, how are we going to get them out? Multi-generational families would be a great solution to get these people out. Uh, one of the stories that I, that I saw was a young woman who's mother of three children, and she's trying to visit a Costco. And she can't get in because Costco has now had a policy that there's only two people allowed to come in the store at, at a time. And for some reason, they're now giving her a hard time because she has three kids with her. And this is a great health hazard for some reason. And her complaint is, I can't go to work because I have to watch my kids. I can't hire somebody to watch my kids because I can't hire anybody because everybody's locked in place. And now I can't even go buy essential supplies because your policy says no more than two people can come in the store. Now, imagine if she belonged to a multi-generational household and you had mom and dad or father-in-law and mother-in-law at home or even great-grandpa and great-grandma. This would be a situation that would show that there's not just value in the wisdom, but there's a great utility in this. Uh, and that's really my experience uh, as a young person too. I've shared before that my mom was pregnant with me when she was 15 years old. And so what the responsibility was 
uh, in their Catholic home was that my dad and his mom took my mother in. They got married. I was born. And this multi-generational household took care of the new child. Now, the, the modern world says the nuclear family isn't good enough to provide for this child. The biblical solution says that was never the solution to begin with. We depended on multi-generational families and churches and communities. It was never enough just to have a single solitaire mother and father to raise a child. And before people accuse me of thinking like Hillary Clinton's, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. No, it takes the kingdom to raise a child. Faithful parents who covenant together to create a next generation of kingdom people who understand God's law. And that's why the church is described as brothers and sisters in Christ and mothers and fathers, you know, these terms of respect. It's not accidental that the pastor or the priest would be referred to as father. These are family terms that signify a unity and a community so that it takes a village is almost right. And of course, the village, according to the author of that phrase, is going to be the state. But if you have the family and then the church family, this is how, as an institution, the family can stand against conflicting or overreaching institutions. Why today, when people are told you can't go to work, that they don't seem to have much recourse other than protest? Well, because we don't have trustee families in place that you have families that live in the same community and they say, you know what, we're going to work. And somebody says, no, you can't. And the family is strong enough to say, "Um, we beg to differ with you. You're outside your jurisdiction. But because we've looked at the family as the place we sleep and eat until somebody gets to be 18 years old and then they move on, we've lost the exact power that God has instituted as how he plans to see the great commission filled and how the great commission will transfer into the kingdom of God. It's through families. And when we disperse the family and we say children should be sent here so I can go to work and elderly parents or grandparents can be sent here so we can go to work. What are we saying is the most important thing in our life? Money. And this service of mammon is is really ingrained in our culture. And you can kind of see it as you know, this personal prosperity gospel, but you can see it in both the poor elderly and in the affluent elderly. I mean, the, there's an entire industry of catering to senior needs. There are senior retirement homes. There are, in fact, entire states like Florida who have the reputation of being senior retirement areas. And so what we have shifted from is a cohesive family identity where grandparents have a active role in the household, meaning that there was grandma and parents raising grandchildren. And you can still see this alive in other cultures. Uh, My bishop talks about how in China, childcare is not an issue. Finding a babysitter is not an issue. Mothers aren't worn down and run ragged because there's this network of people who live in their community, who live in their village, where the kids all grow up together. Cousins treat each other like brother and sister. Aunts and uncles share the the burdens of food preparation, shopping, uh, taking care of clothing, education, all of those things that you would imagine the Christian community is trying to now replicate were built together as a common burden. And instead, the American consumer model now puts the entire burden of life onto a husband and a mother. And the reaction to that is that modern feminism has rejected a anti-biblical model and said this is the biblical model, right? The the modern feminist who rejects the housewife model of the 1950s is justified because it's not a realistic model and it's not a biblical model because it doesn't take into account that the biblical imperative for the Proverbs 31 woman is in the context of a multi-generational family. And when that isn't there, it's in the context of a church family. And when that's not there, it's in the faith-based community. And so the great disservice we're doing is by allowing our American superficial consumeristic model to take precedence 
And it begins with our understanding of what the purpose of our vocation is with the goal of the elderly is we are really destroying or undermining the very foundation of power that God has given to the Christian community. And which is very ironic about this whole sheltering in place because we want to preserve life. Those who are espousing this don't really care about the life of the unborn, don't really care about the life of those who are sick and elderly. We wouldn't have a whole move to legalize euthanasia if these people weren't considered burdens. And I think the temptation is, you know, we'll accept the statism because then I don't have to see things I don't want to see. So if we didn't have welfare, we might have beggars at our door. I don't want beggars at my door. So you know what? I'll pay the taxes that it takes for the state to distribute welfare. I don't want sick people who potentially could die in my household. So I'll buy into the idea that if somebody is experiencing dementia or Alzheimer's, I've got to ship them out and let the professionals deal with them. Well, the professionals don't love them. And if, if you don't love them enough to take care of them, what injury that does to your children who say, wow, I guess this is how mom and dad want to be treated when they're old. And it's, it's sad because a lot of this could be prevented with a biblical foundation. Uh, what's really both ends of here, you talk about you know, kind of government, the government subsidization of the elderly. We have these senior homes. You have folks who are living off of what has been described as retirement income through Social Security. And we've really built a system that will fail the elderly. There is not enough money in Social Security today to fund the elderly. The amount of money that the people receive on Social Security does not meet the needs of the elderly. And with the rising cost of uh, goods and the pace of inflation, which will certainly be exacerbated with the current stimulus packages, the elderly are really being attacked from every front. And so the Christian thing to do uh, really is to question, why is grandma in a nursing home? What have we done in our social policy, our view of the future, to put the elderly in such a position that even after a life of work or a life of labor, they are still relegated to these positions of poverty, of, of servitude. The one, the one crazy thing about really all of this is that the Bible's perspective is that the elderly will be the people who give a blessing to the young through the idea of inheritance. And we can see that that's not the case. The phrase in American culture today is, if I had a rich grandpa, or if I had a rich uncle. And it's kind of like this pie in the sky, I hope there might be a windfall that would, that would save me from my current irresponsibility. But the normal in American culture is that, as you said, Andrea, the, the elderly are a financial, an emotional, a physical burden, and not a blessing to the next generation. Yet, the book of Proverbs says that, you know, blessed is the man who stores up a wealth and passes it on as an inheritance to his children. But that's really not the pattern we have in American culture today. If you're a person of means, you're not storing up those means to pass it on to the next generation. In fact, you're afraid that the next generation might squander it. So before Johnny squanders his trust fund, you go ahead and you buy a motorhome and you travel the country, or you become a snowbird and you travel back and forth, or you invest in your timeshare, or whatever leisure it is that you want to do, you spend the inheritance before it gets to the next generation. And then, I remember there was a bumper sticker that was prevalent decades ago that says, I, it was on the back of motorhomes, I'm spending my children's inheritance. Yeah. And meanwhile, the, the American family says, oh, I can't afford a Christian education, or I can't afford to send my son to a real Christian school for a university, or I can't afford to tithe to the church. Well, because we've squandered this idea of multi-generational wealth. Uh, we have so atomized or centralized the idea of culture around the individual that we have lost, that God's plan of salvation is for the family and for the group of families. Remember, Israel was not just a nation of individuals. It was a collection of tribal families. And the Lord does the same thing. He passes it down to 
husbands, who lead households, and the pattern has not changed. What's changed is we have continually rejected the family because we have accepted the provision of the new father, that is the, the, the potter national, you know, this, this state father. And we can see that they believe themselves to be this paternal relationship. When grandma dies, how much of her inheritance goes to the state? You know, how much of her retirement is recollected into the state coffers? Well, what does that say about who owns the family? If grandma pays her retirement savings into Social Security and the state manages it, that means that the state has authority over the family's generational wealth. If the state collects the will and takes a death tax over whatever wealth collected, that says that the state controls the family. And these are all such recent and novel ideas designed and intended to break down the family to break down the idea of wealth so that the poor and the weak among us are now subservient and dependent upon the state. And it goes a little step further than that. If you're a family and you want grandma to take care of your, you know, the children, you don't get the same tax credit you would get if you hired somebody outside the family. And the same Mm. is true if somebody is ill and has in-home care You can't have and expect to be reimbursed by the state having a family member come ahead, come along and help. And so interestingly enough, the whole economic system is meant to discourage family participation. And then you have people usually in their middle years who are in a position that they might be taking care of children and elderly parents. And I've heard this said so many times, and I really have to restrain myself from physically swatting the person. You know what? When I get older, I don't want to be a burden on anybody. Mm -hmm. And so, you know what? I just, I just hope I don't live long and I'm going to leave instructions that nobody should try to keep me alive. Mm -hmm. What does that say about the value of life? And what does that say? about burdens. You know, sometimes we're taught, we're sanctified through the problems we have in life. But if we've decided the best possible outcome is no burdens, we're really saying that we know better than God. That's right. That's right. And this is gets back to the idea of burden is because you have used the measuring rod of utility. You've said, well, I'm a burden now because I can't earn the same salary I earned at 40 or at 30. And so now that I'm 65, now that they don't want me to work at this same job, I'm a burden because I don't contribute the same financial number as I did 10 years ago. Uh, but there's a real problem there because a lot of people think in that trajectory. Um, and I'm a little bit away from there, so maybe it's easier for me to say this. But do we have in the kingdom of God a sense that we get to retirement from, get to retire from what God has called us to do? Right. I'm sure that, Andrew, you can speak to how Dr. Rushduni worked past 65 and how you and your husband intend to work past 65. But do you think that the idea of ceasing from kingdom work at 65 is at all biblical? No. As a matter of fact, the Bible doesn't even speak about retirement. Okay. You may stop doing something that you had done. So let's say you were somebody who worked in construction. All right. There comes a point maybe that you can't wield the hammer as well as you could, that your your balance isn't as good as it could be. So you may stop making a living that way. And let's say you live with your family. doesn't mean that you can't take all the experience and skill and help fix things around your house, become a handyman to help other people. Even if you don't get paid, if you do somehow or other have a retirement, that you're still working for the kingdom. My husband is in his 70s, and people are often surprised that he's still working. And they're like, how long do you plan to keep working? And he says, until God takes me home. Now, does that mean he'll always be able to work in the same capacity he did 20 years ago or present? No, but he won't stop working. And if we're faithful and we seek first the kingdom then all those reasons we work, food, clothing, and shelter, will be taken care of. But Mm -hmm. the kingdom involves being an asset to your family so your family wouldn't even think about 
sending you out to pasture. And, and you did ask the question about Dr. Rushduni and his wife. Both of them died at home. Both of them had, at least at the end, periods of extended care needed. And I'm not saying that it was probably easy for his son and his son's family every single day to do it, but it ended up being a blessing to them and a closeness. My mother-in-law lived with us until she died. We were with her when she died. And I'm so grateful that my children got a chance to experience that. No, they weren't too young to experience death. They needed to understand this is what happens. And I still remember we were together and my daughter, who at the time I think was maybe three years old, is singing Jesus Loves Me to my mother-in-law. And we could see a tear come down my mother-in-law's eye. In other words, somehow or other, she was perceiving what was going on. And so we should never just assume that we know what God is doing. God will take us when he's ready for us. Right. And that gets to this idea that your vocation, your calling in God is really larger than whatever job you have for this stage, right? You're, you're going to go through different vocational stages throughout your calling of God. And so as a young man, you might be an apprentice and then you might become a, a master at whatever skill you have and you'll serve the majority of your life doing that thing that your intellectual or physical abilities provide for you to do. But then it doesn't end with that. Now, after you are master, you don't go into the pasture. You're not a horse that now has overdone its utility and is now put out into the field to die. You now have the ability to pass on something special to the next generation based on your experience in commerce and in godliness. I think of uh, my predecessors here at Canterbury, uh, Reverend Milbank, who's a, a longtime Chalcedon supporter. This idea of starting a Christian school was his retirement project. He had been a, a bursar at Stanford University. He had been an, a successful insurance broker. Those were his, you know, his early careers. And they had given him real world experience so that when he felt called to ministry, to pastor and to lead a school, even though he's in his 60s, this did not stop him. The idea of retirement did not stop him from following where the kingdom was leading. And so from his 60s until almost 100 years old, this man every year invested into hundreds of students, uh, ministering and really getting up at the crack of dawn every morning, going in, teaching chapel, uh, leading the students, investing in their lives. And he did it until he died. And there are now thousands of little Christians out there expanding the kingdom because this man refused to allow the world's definition of value or utility to stop him from achieving or pushing forward the kingdom's presence here on earth. And that's what a quote-unquote retirement should look like. Not that you spend all your time looking for adventures or leisure activities. Not that those things aren't part of it, but you know, the Bible says you work six days and you rest on a Sabbath. It doesn't say you work for 65 years, Monday through you know Sunday, and you never take a break. And then what happens is you get into your little Winnebago and you go around and you act like you have no responsibilities. The mm -hmm. Sabbath pattern doesn't go away just because you might have aged out of a particular job. It remains, and it's up to the faithful Christian to be anticipating the change. You know, there comes a part for women where they're no longer going to bear children. And there comes a time when they call it empty nest, where the children are now living their adult lives with their families. But even if you don't live close to your own biological family, there are plenty of families within church circles, not unlike this woman going to Costco, who could have used a church grandma mm -hmm. and, and to say, not wait to be asked, but to say, who can I help? If you have everybody looking at how they can help members of their own family or members of their 
church family, I think we'll have a very, very healthy dynamic. But if people say, I don't, I mean, I don't want to intrude, intrude for goodness sakes. If they say they don't want you, then they said they didn't want you, right? And then go to the next person. But let's not be afraid to ask. So if I always say, we're told to bear one another's burdens. Well, if we're to bear each other's burdens, then we have to share our burdens. Because I can't bear what I don't know you need, right? So it becomes a responsibility on both ends. Right. And there is a, a great crisis coming because we've accepted grandma in the nursing home. Paralleled with, with the devaluing of the end of life is really the devaluing of the beginning of life. Our, our country, much like other developed countries or even China, has killed millions of our own children. And so in the upcoming decades, there's going to be a great iniquity between the number of people who are under 50 and the number of people who, who are over 50 because the generation that was supposed to be the social structure, you know, paying into social security, uh, providing those essential services, becoming that tax base, that has become significantly smaller and the elderly population is significantly larger. And we're already seeing in places like China and in you know, the Great Britain where they have a nationalized health service that our devaluation of the elderly is coupled with a push for euthanasia. So as long as we say grandma isn't valuable and we can just put her in a retirement home, then the NHS or the Obamacare system or whatever federalized program is going to say, should we really spend this much on Medicare? Do they really need to be preserved for another 10 years through this surgery or with this medicine? Are they worth it? Or if they're not valuable and they're just wasting their lives in a nursing home, why don't we just push for euthanasia now? And the actions that we have by abandoning the biblical family and accepting these artificial or secular ideas of generations is really going to lead to euthanasia being accepted in, I can imagine at first being widely accepted in Western Europe and then in the United States as they see the consequence of our thinking. If grandma's in a nursing home, grandma's not valuable. Therefore, why are we wasting resources on them? The kingdom has the exact opposite. Grandma is the high point of Christian culture. She has the accumulated wisdom, knowledge, and skills that are essential to pass on to the next generation. And if grandma lived her right life correctly, she has an inheritance to pass on to the next generation, which gives grandma the influence to say, if my son and my grandson want to come into the blessings and the fruit of the kingdom, they better live lives worthy of, a heritage, of, of an inheritance. And that gives grandma a great bit of power too. It's, it's maligned as you know, grandma is holding on to her money and disinheriting those who are falling away. But that is the kind of generational structure that the Bible has to make sure that there are sanctions for those who rebel against the biblical family. Finances and wisdom and power were consolidated in the elderly because they knew that the young would be unwise or reckless. And so God gives stability to culture by balancing the value of the most precious in the preborn, uh, giving the burden of labor to those in middle of life, and valuing those gray-haired elders as something of gold and diamonds. And so it's kind of the question now is, okay, so we don't have a situation that's ideal or even biblically ideal. How do we get to where we should be from where we are now? Well, I think this can be addressed to people of all ages. If you're young, Connect with your grandparents, however flawed they may be, and recognize that they do have something to share. If you're in the middle, be an example to your children to see how you take care of your parents. And if possible, bring them home. Bring them home and give them a sense of purpose. Not that we're going to bring you home and we're going to be such martyrs and take care of you but we would like you to be part of our family. We would like you to teach our 
kids to sew, to cook, or if you're a grandpa, I like to teach carpentry and how to make things. Let them see that you value them. And if you are the older folks, start realizing that hiding behind your infirmities, of which you might have a significant number, isn't what you're called to do. You're called to operate within the kingdom despite your infirmities. And if you say, well, nobody in my family is close by or I don't have somebody close by, well, this is where you connect in your church. And as the Bible tells us, you'll know that they love one another or you'll know that they're God's people by their love. And Mm -hmm. so that's what we need to get back to. And then the whole idea of what will happen to our economy with all the stimulus checks and uh, is the Republicans trying to do this or the Democrats trying to do this? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else is added unto you. That's right. Thank you for for pointing out that that it might be difficult, too, to connect with your parents and grandparents. I remember what my pastor told me years ago, that when God gave the commandment to honor your father and your mother, to, to honor the elders, he knew exactly who those people would be in your life. And yet he doesn't give that command conditionally. He gives it based on that family heritage. And so as we look at our culture, we need to pay attention to these landmarks, to these warning signs. You know, the, the picture of, of a good and healthy family is at both ends. You know, that we're caring for our children, giving them an upbringing. But then it says that on the outside of that, that the, the men will sit at the gates, that the men will be respected in the city. That's not what we have in American Christianity. We have, instead of our elders in the gates arguing and standing for biblical righteousness, we have locked our our elders behind the glass, behind the doors, inside nursing homes. We have put away the men rather than let their glory shine for the next generation. And in closing, because we're at the end of our time, rather than tell people what to do, I would rather suggest them think about the current guidelines in place, the prohibitions of what you're allowed or not allowed to do, who you're allowed to affiliate with or not. And ask yourself the question, do I obey God or do I obey the state when the state is making pronouncements that are contrary to the scripture? What is more important than caring for your own? What is more important than actually realizing that for the older folks, they might not be unwilling to catch a cold or a virus if they had the love and the hugs of their grandchildren. That the worst thing that happens to the believer is not death. That's not the worst that can happen. The worst that can happen is to die without Christ and to Leave the elderly in a place with people who are being paid to take care of them rather than love them enough to take care of them is something that I find that God won't honor. And we don't want to travel down the road where we keep doing things that displease God. Very true. Let us build a culture that honors the young, honors the old, and says that God has the solutions for our families for our culture, and that it's right there in the Bible. Let us build biblical families from birth to natural death. And listeners, if anybody has an anecdote, something that you do that and be of value to other people, please send in your comments to out of the question podcast at gmail.com. And we'd love to share them with other people because I'm sure, and I think you'd agree with me, Steve, we've skimmed the surface on things that people can do. I'm sure there are people already doing this faithfully. Mm -hmm. Nice talking with you, Steve. Listeners, join us next time when we come back with another question in the Out of the Question podcast. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.